I'm John Bowen, and I teach anthropology at Washington University in St. Louis. What is pluralism? I think a pluralism is a situation where there are different groups, people recognizing themselves as being perhaps part of a nation, but also having their own allegiances as in terms of an ethnic group or a cultural group or a religious group. What are the main levers of inclusion? I think the main lever of inclusion or for inclusion is that everybody feels like they have a stake in the society and the broader success of the society. So that could, be, that could mean everybody feeling like they have an equal chance. It could mean feeling that you have a, you have a bit of uh, social life that uh, you're quite good in, you're success, successful at. I'll give a couple of examples. In, uh, uh, in Indonesia, the demographically largest group are the Javanese, but in fact, per capita, other groups from what are called the outer islands of Sumatra and eastern Indonesia do better in a lot of fields, in education, in, in the entertainment industry, and even in government. So that gives everybody a sense that they've got a part of the pie. What are the greatest obstacles to inclusion? Well, not feeling like you have a stake in society. So if people feel like on all, on all scores they're cut out, uh, then, then they have no real reason to feel like they're, they, they should uh, conform to the wishes of the rest of the society. Let me talk about France, where I work. This is a main problem in recruiting people for the jihad, is people who are convinced by the internet or by people talking to them that they, they don't have any stake in France. They don't have jobs, they don't have any opportunity, they don't have any respect. They get nothing from France, so they should go over and fight with their Muslim brothers and sisters. So to change that, you have to make people feel that they do have a stake by working on jobs and working on respect. National identities often forget minorities. Can nationhood and pluralism be combined? Well, one way to combine nationhood and pluralism is to have some sort of over, overarching ideology that allows for difference but gives everybody a a sense of belonging to the same nation. So I'll give you an example from Indonesia where I do a lot of my work. There is a strong myth, and I mean this in a positive sense, that everybody in Indonesia contributed to the revolution against the Dutch in the uh, late 1940s. Even if they were Javanese or in, in Sumatra or in the East, they were part of the fight against the Dutch. And so people feel a shared pride, and that myth is played up. And it isn't just a myth in the sense of something made up. It has a real effect on how people consider their loyalties. Does religion pose a special challenge to pluralism? I think religion does pose a special challenge to pluralism, a relatively special challenge in the sense that people can be more easily mobilized to fight against other people if those who are doing the mobilizing, political leaders, uh, other sorts of uh, entrepreneurs, are appealing to their sense of a religious obligation, religious duty, or religious loyalty, compared to their sense of sharing a language or sharing an ethnic background. Religion really hits home for people, and it's easier to get them to fight against others if that's the ground on which you're trying to mobilize them. What are the opportunities and challenges for pluralism offered by decentralization? Decentralization, devolution, can have some real positive effects if it gives people a sense that they can, uh, they can develop some of their own ideas and their own practices, even while remaining part of the nation. And I'll give you an example from Indonesia, where I do a lot of my work. There was a strong devolution carried out in the early 2000s, and it's given some provinces the, the capacity to develop systems of customary law and uh, cultural bodies based on the commonalities in the region. The big problem with decentralization, well, let me mention two. One can be that uh, if individual rights are ignored, so you can have the problem often thought of as minorities within minorities. Women are given less uh, of a fair shake than they would be if a strong state were enforcing gender discrimination laws. And another one can be if a province does something that really uh, offends other people in the country. Aceh, for example, to remain with the Indonesian case, is developing a legal system based on Sharia. It's something I study. I think it, too much is made out of it, but it's something that could potentially cause problems for the legal unity of the country. Is there only one type of pluralism? I think there are many routes to peaceful, successful pluralism. Some can emphasize the equality of all individuals. France would be a good case, where there's very low tolerance for self-expression in terms of minorities or ethnic groups. Some are very pluralistic in their conception of who they are. Indonesia is another case, as are many other countries, where there's a strong recognition of different ethnic difference. There's not one model for the world, and we shouldn't try to impose it on other countries. How can states address groups that feel excluded? So people who are being successfully recruited into jihad, say, in Britain or France or Belgium or elsewhere, are being fed a narrative that they buy, that they have no stake in their country. They need a counter-narrative, backed up with some facts. So two levels have to be addressed. One are those facts, job chances, 
equal opportunity in getting access to higher education, which are woefully lacking for many of these people in, these, in the countries I mentioned. And the other one is the counter-narrative. So what is the basis for their loyalty to France or Belgium or England? Why should they consider themselves to be French or Belgian or something else? And that has to do with a narrative which is inclusive. So we can work on the narrative, but we also have to have the jobs. Let me talk about why countries don't do something obvious, which is to take strong measures to make their economies more inclusive. It's hard work. It takes a lot of political unity and a lot of money. It's much easier to sort of hammer on again and again about uh, uh, problems of, of identity and of integration. We, we see it in the U.S., we see it in France, we see it in many countries where people are, are accused of not integrating, where what they're really trying to do is integrate, get jobs, be members of that society. But that's much harder than just a sloganeering. How does North America differ from Europe in its attitudes towards migrants? So there are two big differences between Europe and North America in terms of the issues around immigration and radicalism. One is that uh, Canada and the United States think of themselves as settler societies. People came from other places. So when more immigrants come, there's no reason why they shouldn't be welcomed as long as they play by the rules. That's not the case in Europe, even though Europe, Europe also has had a great deal of immigration. About one in three French people have at least one grandparent who came from some other country. But the narrative isn't about being a country of immigration. It's being a count of a country of people who have been there all their lives. That's one, that's one big difference. So uh, the North American narrative is much easier to, it's much easier to accept immigrants on, uh, in, in, our, in our countries than in Europe. The second big difference is that just to talk about Muslim immigrants to Canada and the United States, they're slightly better off than is the average person in those countries. And it's quite different, a quite different story in Western Europe, where they're much, much poorer off. So they were brought in as largely unskilled laborers after World War II. Each country in Europe has its own particular uh, problems. Germany's problem was that it refused to think about Turks who had been coming in since the 1950s as eventually becoming citizens. France didn't have that problem because it has a much broader notion of citizenship and people have become citizens quite easily and quite quickly in, in France. Its problem was a racism that had been fueled by colonial practices of domination. Britain's problem was quite different. Britain's very open and welcoming of different communities and they allowed communities to sort of uh, build themselves in a rather isolated manner and their problem then is constructing some kind of British narrative out of that that'll make everybody feel involved.